time. Sure. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Spencer Bogus, um, and uh, I'm from U.S. Trust. But uh, more importantly, I am uh, here because I uh, have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the Education Committee, the Greenwich Roundtable. As some of you will know, the Education Committee was responsible for two publications, Best Practices in Hedge Fund Investing, and the first part, Due Diligence for Equity Strategies, which came out in July of 2005, and Due Diligence for Global Macro and Managed Futures, which came out uh, just last month. Um, there is, of course, an important link between the work of the Roundtable's Education Committee and tonight's topic of discussion, Due Diligence, the Art of Investigation. Um, in essence, our publication was about a lot of things, but about uh, mostly one big thing, and that is the importance of verifying claims about people, about individuals, <coughs> about their backgrounds, about the work they've claimed to have done. Um, it was about doing your own work carefully, doing your own, and drawing your own painstaking conclusions. Um, uh, this group has uh, an enormous amount to contribute on that subject uh, with their profession, with their individual um, work activities um, to uh, help uh, explore the backgrounds of these individuals. Uh, I thankfully have uh, Don Carlson on my left uh, who uh, is our moderator this evening and he has uh, an extraordinarily impressive pedigree and one with um, uncanny relevance for this evening's session. Um, Don um, was CEO of a company that uh, did a uh, principal amount of work in this space that is the, the business of due diligence and intelligence. At Goldman Sachs, he was the chief of staff of the office of the general counsel. Um, he was also the chief knowledge officer of the investment banking division. At the corporate executive board, he was a managing director responsible for new business development. Uh, the corporate executive board is a strategy consulting firm and he was part of the senior team that helped take it public. Uh, he was also a professor at Williams College. Um, if you saw the rest of his resume, you would know a career of highlights with no lowlights. Uh, but without further ado, please know that I bask in considerable candle power over here. <laughs> Don, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Spencer. I just want to say, in all my years at Goldman Sachs, I never got a tombstone. And so my night's good already. This is pretty amazing. So. Um, <coughs> Chief knowledge officers don't get tombstones, I learned after I joined the investment bank there. Um, my role tonight is pretty simple. It's, I think, to keep things moving along. And um, I have three colleagues to my, to my left who have a lot more substantive knowledge about how to actually do the business of due diligence than I'll ever have. So it's my privilege to introduce each of them in turn. And they're actually lined up in the order in which they'll speak. Uh, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions. I have some questions to ask them, but uh, I think we'll get a lot more energy out of the room and have a, probably a much better dialogue if you come forward with questions. So I'll, I'll encourage you and defer to you in, in calling on you to ask questions or even make comments or um, make provocative asides, if you wish, um, to, the, to the panelists. And they've been encouraged to ask questions of each other as well. Um, so let me uh, go into the introductions just to give you a sense of who we have here tonight. Uh, Jim Roth is as close as you can come to the genuine article. Uh, he was trained at, the UC at UCLA in engineering and then was recruited into the Central Intelligence Agency, where he spent a very colorful 15 years uh, with a history of, of assignments in Europe, the South Pacific, and the Middle East, most of which he won't tell me about. Um, but he also ran the agency's counterterrorism and anti-proliferation uh, responsibilities out of the Ankara Turkey office as his last posting, uh, where he had a very senior position there. Um, he spent his career entirely in the Directorate of Operations, which is, uh, I've learned in working with CIA folks a lot for the last couple of years, that's the part of the agency we all think about when we watch a Robert Ludlum or a Tom Clancy movie. That's the, that's the real secret agents. Um, he served as both a case officer, who are the guys out there in the field, men and women out there in the field who are recruiting sources every day, um, and also as a reports officer. And what a reports officer does is direct the case officers to get, you know, to find new information, and then also synthesize the data that they collect and, and turn it into real intelligence so that it can go back to Langley or Washington and be acted upon. He's the only person I know, actually, in the agency who has done both of those roles. And it's quite an uncommon feat uh, to, for somebody to pull that off. Um, I was very privileged to work alongside Jim myself through much of last year. We worked at the same company. And to watch him work is actually to understand the value of skilled intelligence in the investment arena. Um, his job is principally to talk to clients, mostly uh, fund managers, who then present him with an investment thesis. And what he does is he distills it down to two or three material facts that will actually influence the outcome. You know, to, so change the probability of that thesis coming true or not and allow them to make a much more informed investment. 
Um, he does that through a lot of novel source development, and he does it through what I can only analogize to what a surveyor does when they triangulate. Um, picking sources that none of us would think about, combining what they do together and what they can offer together, and coming up with a, a basis for an inference. Um, so it's really quite a remarkable process to watch. Jim left the government in 2000 uh, to take a position in London with a Fortune 50 company with a focus on evaluating the risks that were material to their own business in some emerging markets, some of their bigger investments. Um, and then he started his own company, Insight International Incorporated, um, which was an intelligence gathering business that was dedicated entirely to working with hedge fund managers. Um, and and that, that was his client base. He now runs that business as part of uh, Diligence LLC, where he's a managing director. And when you don't find him there, you do find him actually out on the volleyball or basketball courts where his pride and joy, his two teenage daughters are uh, regular uh, attendees, and he's either coaching or cheering on any given weekday night. Uh, Bethany McLean, our next panelist, is best known as an investigative reporter who broke the Enron story um, through her very groundbreaking work with uh, Fortune magazine. She turned that story into a book along with Peter Elkind in 2003 um, called The Smartest Guys in the Room which is routinely referred to in reviews online as the definitive account of the Enron debacle. The, the book is now a major motion picture, as they say, um, stamped on the cover. And I understand you were at the Oscars last weekend, right? Because the film, the, the documentary was actually nominated for an Oscar in the Best Documentary category. So congratulations on that, Bethany. Um, Bethany joins us tonight, having just flown in from the Enron trial, uh, attending Andrew Fasto's testimony over the last couple of days, and we actually planned this event around a scheduled break in the trial, just so Bethany could be here tonight. <laughs> what, is, what is less known about Bethany is the incredible tenacity and intelligence that it took to stay with the Enron story through the early years, uh, despite the condescending and often brutal responses that she got from Ken Lay, Jeff Skilling, and the other principals in the story as well as many analysts who had fallen under the Enron spell. I'll plead guilty on that one as well. Uh, more than once, Bethany was put off and put down with the dis dismissive comment that you just don't get it. Well, Bethany did get it. Uh, she's a graduate of Williams College and a veteran of the analyst program at Goldman Sachs. Two institutions are very near to my own heart. Those organizations are famous for their belief in the virtue of tenacity, their commitment to critical thinking, and their shared view that the smartest guys in the room often aren't. Bethany demonstrates those qualities in a way that must make her old professors and mentors proud. In her work on the Enron investigation, no answer was accepted at face value. Every argument was evaluated critically. And eventually, she and her colleagues dug out the truth for all the world to see, now on display in a courtroom in Texas every day. We're really happy to have you with us tonight, Bethany. And Jules Kroll. Many of us know Jules as the founder of Kroll Incorporated, one of the world's leading investigative firms with a specialization in risk consulting. Jules founded the firm in 1972 and captained it through many transitions, many different businesses, up through and including the sale of the firm to Marsha McLennan in 2004. And also a public offering along the way as well, right? A few. Sorry? A few. A few, right, exactly, right. Um, <coughs> Jules is now vice chairman of Marsh Inc. and Kroll is closely integrated with Marsh's insurance and investment operations. It's absolutely not an exaggeration to call Jules the father of the modern investment due diligence industry. He took Kroll into this field as a pioneer before most people understood the concept of risk mitigation through thorough investigation. By building a team of former prosecutors, law enforcement officials, journalists, and academics, all of whom took unique approaches to fact-finding, Jules and his colleague took the discipline of commercial investigation to a whole new level. Jules is himself a former prosecutor. After graduating from Cornell and Georgetown University Law Center, he became an assistant district attorney in Manhattan. He has maintained very strong and robust connections with law enforcement at every level through his nearly 35 <coughs> years in this business. We're privileged to have the founder of the industry with us tonight to give us his perspective on how the due diligence industry has evolved and where it's heading. So with that, we'll start with my colleague, Jim Roth. All right. Well, I'm going to start with a confession. And uh, what, what Don didn't tell you is that uh, uh -oh. <laughs> the, <laughs> the reason that I left the CIA in, in uh, 2000 after 15 years was to accept a position as the head of intelligence for the uh, European headquarters of uh, Enron. So uh, anyway, I, I, uh, I, uh, I just want to say right up front that I, 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 uh, I do recognize the irony of, uh, <laughs> of uh, sitting here before you, a, a group of very uh, sophisticated investors, uh, to discuss the importance of due diligence when my, my own first uh, commercial due diligence pro uh, uh, 
project was uh, uh, ended up with me leaving a uh, very good career uh, to go with a shirt thing that turned out to be Enron. So uh, anyway, and I, and I suspect that I'm about to become a source for Bethany McLean's next, <laughs> <laughs> next, next bestseller, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I think I'm supposed to address the, um, uh, the art of, of investigation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, a little bit of a twist on that and, and address the, uh, uh, the art of intelligence collection. Uh, and, and I'll start with uh, providing a little bit of a brief background on, on the CIA's intelligence collection model and, uh, and then talk a little bit about how some of those techniques can be applied uh, in doing due diligence on, on hedge funds. Uh, the CIA model involves a number of roles and, uh, and skill sets uh, that include a case officer. This is a guy in the field. This is where I spent most of my career. This is a guy in the field uh, that's, uh, whose expertise is in establishing uh, networks of clandestine sources and exploiting them for information uh, through a variety of different methods. That, uh, that includes uh, interrogation, which is, which is coercive. Uh, I, I assume you guys don't do that much of you, that uh, in doing uh, due diligence on hedge funds. Uh, debriefings, uh, which involve uh, cooperative interviewees. Uh, an elicitation where the source is unaware that they're being targeted for information subtly. Uh, and in fact, elicitation is the most common method of uh, getting information for a case officer. Uh, every case officer is very busy doing elicitation at, at, at uh, every diplomatic cocktail party. Uh, that, that it's a very common thing. Uh, there's uh, requi reports or requirements officers. Uh, Don, Don mentioned that role as well. That's a uh, Reports officer is uh, somebody who's based in Washington who, who's a substantive expert, and they usually cover a specific issue. Uh, they, you know, maybe Russian military or, or state-sponsored terrorism uh, or something like that, and they inter uh, interact very closely uh, with Washington uh, policy makers on their, their area of expertise uh, to keep up with uh, imminent uh, policy decisions. Uh, to identify gaps and uncertainties and contradictions in the information that's available uh, to, 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 to policymakers, and then to take that data and to, to translate it into what we call uh, intelligence collection requirements that go out through to, to case officers all over the world. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the policymaker, who's the ultimate uh, consumer of intelligence. And um, uh, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that a, probably 95% of the information that uh, policymakers use actually come from a combination of diplomatic reporting and, uh, and open source reporting. Uh, so there is a, sometimes a big element of party line in the information that they have available to them through uh, most of the information. Uh, and you know that, that's what foreign governments want them, want us to think. Uh, and oftentimes it's deliberately misleading. And I'm sure, for example, that the Secretary of State still gets regular diplomatic cables that come in. Uh, that say that uh, a North Korean official has once again assured us that uh, North Korea is not, in fact, interested in building a nuclear program. But, in, uh, you know, that, that's, that's spin. It's not true. And uh, so policymakers obviously uh, rely for, uh, on intelligence for, to fill in those gaps in the information and to, and to uh, cut through the spin. Uh, so e even though intelligence makes up, a, a, you know, what really amounts to kind of a small part of the whole package, it's really crucial to, to making a well-informed well uh, decision. Uh, you know, when that, when that cycle, as I've described, works, very w works well, and, and, and I am uh, painfully aware that the uh, CIA intelligence collection cycle doesn't always work well. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot of stories about that recently. But when it does work well, it's a very interactive, very dynamic uh, a process that involves, you know, case officers from all over the world sending in intelligence information, policymakers reading it on a daily basis and having that influence their decisions, uh, giving feedback to, re to reports or requirements officers uh, that then goes back into refining collection requirements that go back out and it's a very uh, dynamic uh, kind of continuous cycle. Uh, this past weekend, I, I, I actually sat down and, and read the, uh, uh, the Greenwich Roundtable's uh, due diligence best practice guides. And uh, it, it occurred to me when I was reading those that, uh, uh, that in, in doing the due diligence that you do on, on hedge funds, that you are all really replicating uh, all of the roles, uh, uh, all of the functions that I just described in, in the CIA's intelligence collection model. So I thought it would be uh, of some interest to talk a little bit about some of the finer points of these roles as they may, may relate to, uh, to your due diligence efforts. 
in, intelligence collection in its simplest form really consists of three basic elements, whether it's in the government w world or whether it's in the private sector, and, and those include uh, uh, finding people who have insights uh, uh, that are important to your making an, an informed decision, getting them to speak to you candidly, which is not, not an easy thing to do, and using the resulting information to uh, draw accurate conclusions. And, um, and, and by the way, I, in, in applying this to, to the due diligence that you do, I, I think I'm going to make a distinction between uh, interviewing head, hedge fund managers and interviewing third parties about them. Uh, in, in interviewing hedge fund managers, uh, or, or anyone really who is the subject of the due diligence that you're doing, I think it's important to, to approach the interview questions uh, very strategically. Uh, I think coming up with the right due diligence issues to address is only, uh, is only half of the, the trick. I think just as important is figuring out how to ask the questions. Uh, there's, a, there's many ways to ask any, any given question. And, and you know, it's important to put the time into thinking about uh, the most effective way to phrase the question for, for the, the given audience. Uh, I think, for example, um, instead of asking a hedge fund manager, <clears throat> how confident are you about maintaining consistent returns with your strategy going forward, you might consider asking, if your strategy were to suffer diminished returns, what would be the most likely cause? I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of taking the same issue, but asking about it in an entirely different way, which elicits a, a very different response. Um, also, I think in, in, in interviewing um, subjects of due diligence, fund managers and others, uh, I think it's useful to make it evident right up front uh, that you've done your, your homework, uh, but without showing your whole hand. And, and one of the ways that you can do that, I think, is, is to ask questions that you already know the answers to and uh, d to determine based on the, the subsequent discussion uh, whether his answers track with what you know to be the case and how forthcoming uh, he is. Um, I, I, just as an example, I, I worked recently with an investor that was uh, considering a, a, um, a private equity investment uh, in an established venture that was uh, seeking an increase in, in capitalization. And, and the initial secondary research uh, surfaced a, a trail of litigation that involved um, the principal, it, it really wasn't a, a major concern initially because it was a very litigious sector. Um, but subsequent intelligence on, on very select pieces of the litigation uh, yielded uh, additional concerns about the principal's uh, cavalier attitude toward compliance with court orders and uh, disregard for smaller counterparties, uh, stuff that was not on the public record. Um, even then, the investor was willing to uh, give the principal the benefit of, of the doubt if he had responded candidly about those issues and, and had reasonable ex explanations for them. Uh, in any case, in a, in a follow-up interview uh, with him, uh, the questions were structured very carefully to give him the opportunity of, of voluntarily acknowledging these issues up front. Uh, instead, uh, the principal uh, very consciously chose to, uh, decided to mislead uh, really not realizing uh, till later in the interview that uh, the investor, uh, the extent of the investor's knowledge in some of those non-public uh, details about the litigation. Uh, the way it ended up was the investor pulled out of the, of the deal, uh, not so much because of the, the litigation itself, but uh, really because of his lack of cr uh, candor and credibility. Uh, acquiring information on third parties, um, I think, can sometimes benefit from a slightly different approach. I think. Um, Third parties are sometimes reticent uh, to talk. Um, I, I think that's especially true when they're not familiar with the due diligence process, when they haven't been through it before in any way. Uh, but I think that that's, that's a challenge that's easily overcome with, uh, some, with good preparation and a, and a degree of subtlety, um, which leads to the subject of, of, of elicitation, which I think can be used regardless of who you're talking to. Uh, and I think really to do the, the subject of elicitation uh, justice it would require hours of discussion. But really what it, what it boils down to is, uh, I think, is handling a contact uh, not as a formal interview but more as an in, informal uh, uh, conversation. And one of the ways I think that you, you can do to support that approach is to accumulate background information on, e on each source prospect, even if they're not the subject of the due diligence, but to, to accumulate some background information on, on the person that you're going to talk to in advance of the, the, the discussion. They get to know them, uh, find out things that you have in common, look for ways to build, to build rapport. Uh, if I'm calling somebody in Cleveland, uh, I'm probably going to look in the newspaper and see how the Browns or the Indians are doing. And, and I'm, and that's, I'm going to weave that into the conversation. And you know what? 80% of the time, it's going to take well. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, that's just something to think about. I think one, one way to think about this is that really no two interviews uh, should be handled in the same way. 
um, I, I think e even if you're addressing the exact same questions with two people, you're still going to approach it in a slightly different way, uh, it, such that go going into the interview, uh, I think, you know, it's important to consider each individual's experience, their expertise, their, their personal interests, their age, their gender, their, their level of sophistication, uh, and to tailor the conversation accordingly to promote uh, candor. Uh, and I think uh, on the subject of uh, elicitation, it's important to keep in mind that some of the best information uh, really comes without ever asking a direct question. Um, for example, volunteering your own opinions often elicits a more detailed response uh, than a direct question does. And to take that one step further, uh, offering a, a deliberately wrong opinion uh, can yield even more useful information, uh, mostly because most people just can't let a wrong opinion go. I mean, it's just, it's, it's human nature and you might as well take advantage of that. Um, just as important uh, as collecting information is uh, evaluating the credibility of the information, uh, which is an art form in itself. And, and uh, uh, intelligence from human sources is often, it's subjective, it's, it's often contradictory. Uh, and I think because of that, two people can often take the same exact uh, raw source information and come to uh, uh, entirely different conclusions. Um, for that reason, I, I've always thought that uh, real sophistication in intelligence collection uh, comes n not from the information collection itself, but, but from uh, the ability to vet the information and to uh, accurately analyze uh, its significance. Uh, a few considerations on, on, on that front in terms of evaluating information. I, I know there's widespread interest in techniques to, uh, to detect deception, you know, kind of the human lie detector thing. And uh, that, that is a useful technique and, and, uh, as, as long as you know how to use it, and, and, but also understand the limitations. Um, in my experience, I think it's generally easier for, for people who uh, are not as familiar with it to, um, to identify verbal indicators of deception rather than physical ones. And some of the things you might look for on that front are uh, uh, ambiguous or, or incomplete answers, uh, defensiveness, deflection of questions, uh, answering something other than what was asked, uh, excessive use of qualifiers, things like maybe, probably. Um, in, in other words, all, all the things that you see in your average presidential debate. You know, it's, uh, um, but again, I think it's important to recognize really what, what does that tell you, even if you're good at it, what, what does it tell you, what are the limits? And really all it tells you is that there's some potential deception there. It doesn't tell you why somebody's lying. It doesn't tell you what the significance of the lie is. And it doesn't tell you the, the true answer to the question that you originally asked. Uh, I think those things really re require good intelligence collection. Um, and, and because of that, I think it's actually more, a more important skill uh, uh, is the ability to assess uh, source bias. Um, I think that, that all sources have some sort of personal bias that, that is going to color uh, the insights that they offer. And, and that doesn't mean that, uh, that the information that comes from them should be discounted, uh, but simply you, you need to understand uh, how it influences the data that they're providing and uh, consider that in uh, reaching conclusions. And, and, and I think that about in evaluating the level and nature of, of any given source's bias uh, requires understanding uh, their access to information, their relationship to the subject of the inquiry, whether there might be some self-serving motive for talking to you and whether they're being candid. And uh, by the way, I, I think that, that people who are genuinely candid about something uh, tend to offer substantiation for their views with very little prompting. And so if you're talking to somebody over a period of time and they offer you a lot of even strong opinions, but they're not backing them up voluntarily with fact or without a lot of prodding, there's probably not a lot of credibility there. I mean, that, that's just the way it works. Um, I, ironically, I think that uh, some, sometimes the most useful information, on a, on a, on especially on subjective issues, actually comes from sources that do have a strong pre, pre, predisposition about something. Uh, but provide opinions that conflict with their personal interests. And just to, that made sense when I wrote it down late last night, but, uh, <laughs> I, but I, I, can't, I really can't explain it any more clearly than that, except for, for just a quick example. I, I, I worked with an investor that was evaluating a private equity fund, and, and uh, uh, in the source of doing some intelligence collection, I, I spoke with a, uh, a longtime business partner of the fund's principals who, who conceded that even though the fund had been very successful, uh, from the beginning that the long-term prospects were, were questionable because of its narrow market niche and the, a, a limited whim, window for the type of uh, asset acquisition in question. <coughs> and the point of that is that uh, in, in that particular case, uh, I'd be in, inclined to assign a very high level of credibility to that opinion 
uh, not simply because of uh, his intimate access uh, to the information, but also because his opinion really went against his own personal interests. Uh, anyway, I'll close with uh, one final comment uh, uh, on that, and that is, uh, I think, in, in reaching um, accurate conclusions about any issue uh, that involves significant due diligence uh, or intelligence collection, uh, there's really no substitute for speaking with, with a wide range of sources who can provide uh, insights from a lot of different perspectives. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Since we have something of an Enron theme going here, I guess I'll talk about my, some of my work on Enron, and given that I've spent a good chunk of the last five years on that very topic and I'm now pretty much living in a Houston courtroom, um, I'll, I'll talk all things Enron. It's funny, my involvement with the story started back in early 2001, and at that time Enron was really an it stock. I think its stock sold at something like 60 times earnings. It had gone up some 90% in, in the year before. Um, every Wall Street analyst who covered the company, with one exception, had a, had a had a buy rating on the stock. And um, my involvement started with a tip from a short seller, a guy named Jim Chanos, who called me up and said, I think you should take a closer look at Enron's numbers. And Jim was very amused because Fortune Magazine, where I work, had named Enron its most innovative company for the past six years running. Um, I like to defend my magazine by pointing out that Enron actually was the most innovative company out there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> unfortunately, we all failed to recognize just how innovative they were. <laughs> But I've gotten, in, in the past years when I've talked about this, I've gotten a lot of questions from audiences. Well, how can you take a tip from a short seller? They're biased. They want a stock to go down. And uh, I, I take tips from everybody. I think everybody has, is biased, whether they're a short seller, whether they're a company management, whether they're a portfolio manager who owns the stock, whether they're a PR person. Everybody has <coughs> bias. And so the trick is just knowing what that bias is, understanding it, and working working with it from there. But I'm, I'm totally indiscriminate. I'll, I'll talk to just about anybody. Um, and Jim also, he didn't, the, 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 the next step in that is can the information the person gives you be, be supported from an independent source? So even though Jim Chanos was an off the record source for me, he told me to go to Enron's financial statements. He didn't say, you know, Jeff Skilling is having an affair with Enron's corporate secretary, which actually turned out to be true, but um, <laughs> would have been a little more difficult to verify. So when I, and that's usually the, the first step I take in any, the next step I take after getting any kind of information is go to whatever documents I can in order to see if it can be supported. And in Enron's financial statements, it was pretty apparent on the surface that something just, just didn't add up. Um, I always, I'm by no means an accountant, but I always look at the difference between a company's earnings and its cash flow. And in Enron's case, while its earnings were marching up nicely at 15% a year, its cash flow from operations was actually negative. Um, the debt on its balance sheet was mushrooming. Um, and there were, its return on invested capital was around 7%, which made no sense for a company that was supposedly incredibly profitable and had this incredibly high P-E ratio. And um, there were all these weird disclosures in Enron's financial statements about these uh, off these, these, this fund that was run by its CFO that was doing that was doing business with Enron. I'd never I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, so this this tip was actually this tip I got was was pretty pretty easily supported by stuff in, in, in the documents. And I as I often do because of my background at, at Goldman, I did all my own spreadsheets in order to 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 lay out my numbers so I wasn't relying on anybody else's analysis or anybody else's numbers. And I've never found I'm sure a lot of you have analysts who do your your who can do numbers numbers for you, but I've never found any substitute for doing it myself because there's nothing like digging through a document and putting together your own your own analysis and so that you understand where, where every piece of something where every piece of something came from. Um, the resulting story I did was had a pretty meek title. It was is Enron overpriced. I had wanted to title it as Enron Hedge Fund and Drag, but um, lost my nerve. <laughs> lost lost my nerve at the last minute. Con <coughs> contrary to perception, we reporters often do care about accuracy. Um, um, I actually, quite honestly, learned more from my mistakes in covering that story than from than from anything I did I did right. And I'd say one big mistake on my part was that I was I was really too naive. When I wrote this story, I questioned a lot about Enron's financial statements, but I didn't write at all about these these partnerships that that were run by the chief financial officer because the accountants and the board of directors had signed off on them. And I thought, well, if the accountants and the board of directors have signed off on them, I guess I must be crazy to think something is wrong here. And the lesson I've taken away from that is that you can never trust gatekeepers because they can always have gotten it wrong. And even the most reputable of gatekeepers like Arthur Anderson and a celebrated board of directors can have can have gotten it 
gotten it badly wrong, and it never pays to be it never pays to be naive. Um, 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 I think the other the other lesson I took away from it was was the red flags in the behavior of Enron management toward me. Um, most companies don't take it kindly when reporters come knocking with skeptical questions. Companies employ armies of public relations people whose sole, jo sole job seems to be to turn the press into an extension of their advertising campaigns. But nonetheless, Enron's reaction was like nothing I had I had ever experienced. Um, Jeff Skilling became very agitated with me on the phone and accused me of being unethical because he said I, I hadn't done enough homework. And if I had done enough homework, I'd see how how silly the questions I was asking were. And that's a really scary thing for a reporter to be told because, as you all know, the truth is you could always have done more homework. They, they, they might be right. You could, you could still be getting it wrong no matter how much work you've done. Um, um, Enron was also an extraordinarily promotional company at that time. I think its stock was around $80 a share, and Jeff Skilling was out there running around saying that it should be $126 a share. And that, that incredibly promotional attitude um, should, have, should have been another, another clue for me that something was really deep, something really could be deeply wrong here, that the company was that obsessed with its, with its stock price. Um, I did something else in the course of writing this story that I've, I've always found helpful, and that's to have somebody else in the room with me. Uh, when I, when en the Enron executives flew up to New York to talk to me before the story ran, and I had two of my editors sit in on this meeting with me. I've always found, I don't know if this is true of everybody, but when you have to present a case and ask questions, it's often very hard at the same time to really do justice to listening to somebody else's answers. Um, and so, it, especially if you're in a confrontational situation with somebody else, that's different if, you're, if you've set up a relationship with a source, then obviously you can listen. But when you're really having to confront somebody else, especially a group of people, I, I, at least I find it helpful to get somebody else in there, somebody independent who can hear what's being asked and what's, what's being answered. And Oddly enough, after this after this meeting, it was my two editors who said who said make the story tougher. These guys these guys didn't answer any of your questions. Um, I never expected that the Enron story would turn into a big story. You know, people in the press talk about looking looking for a big story, and I I never saw it that way at the time. I thought there was something really interesting here. That here was this really celebrated company, and something just di something just didn't add up. The company's fundamentals didn't appear to justify this this the level of interest. And when I talked to people, even though no one would talk to me on the record, portfolio managers, even those who own the stock, would say things like, "I'm I'm I'm scared of them," or characterize their, their meetings for analysts and investors as revival meetings. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I never expected it to turn into this, 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 sort, of, this sort of story. And, and if you had told me at that time that Enron was going to be bankrupt nine months later, I would, have said, I would have said, are you kidding? So when people say I broke the story, I always say not, not even close. I raised a few early questions, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go nearly far enough. Um, after Enron's bankruptcy, I began to work on a book about about the company, and that was, I think, one of the most um, terrifying experiences of my life. Was the early stages of this book contract because since I had landed in the middle of this of this story, it was very easy to get a contract, and suddenly I had a book contract, and there was stuff about Enron on the front page of the paper every day, and. We, my co-author and I just had no idea how we were going to do this because we knew the only way to tell this story was going to be to get ex-employees to talk. But because of the criminal investigation surrounding the company, no one wanted to talk. There were days when I would call 20 or 30 people and no one would call me back. And that, that, that sort of stuff um, becomes, becomes pretty wearing. Um, it's, you know, as, a, as a journalist, uh, we, you, you have nothing but your own powers of persuasion to get, to get people to talk to you. I've always thought, I've been in this courtroom for a while getting to know the process prosecutors and the FBI people on the Enron story, and I've always thought I could do some real damage with some peanut power, but <laughs> don't think that's coming anytime soon. Um, but I, but I, I learned some real lessons about about investigating from 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 this process, and one one big one. There's there's no efficient way to do it. I mean, there's no way you can streamline it. You you have to. I talk to anybody who will talk to me. Um, I call everybody I can think of. Anybody anybody with any connection to to the company. Anybody at any level of the company, because you never know who's going to have interesting information, and you can't handicap who's who's likely to talk to you. You know, you may think, well, this person here is more likely to talk to me. It, it doesn't. You you really can't predict who's actually going to call you back. Um, and you can't predict who's going to be interesting and helpful to you either, because often people at junior levels of the company, maybe even people in the PR ranks, happen to have the best insight in, into what happened. I think 
especially in the case of a company like Enron, the level of self-delusion rises the higher in the ranks you go. And so even if you talk to Enron executives in the years after the bankruptcy, it wasn't as that if they were going to say, yep, here's what was wrong, here's, here's, here's how we did it, here's, here's. And I don't even think many of them had even admitted it to themselves. And it's another lesson about human nature that I came away with from this. I used to think the world was a more black and white place. Either people were doing something wrong and they knew it, or they weren't and they didn't know it. But I didn't, I didn't understand um, how prevalent self-delusion can be, especially in the upper ranks of, of management, and how slow that the process by which we rationalize and, and, and deceive ourselves can be. Jim Chanos actually said to me once that he never met the CEO of a fraudulent company who hadn't somehow come to believe. Um, and that was that was certainly true of, of, um, of the people at Enron. Um, the other thing that helped in our in our investigation, and, and again, there's there's just no efficiency here. We just I went through every single pe document, every single piece of information, all of the backup and the exhibits to any piece of information I could get my hands on. I mean, my take my process when I'm working on any story is just the more the better. Any document I can get my hands on, anything I'll dig through it, and you really do find the most surprising tidbits um, buried in the in the in the back in the back of places. Um, the bankruptcy examiner in the Enron case put out just thousands of pages of, of detailed detailed reports on everything that had gone wrong with the company and there was ju there were just amazing amazing stuff in there and I, I also learned that just because everybody knows something is out there doesn't mean there isn't really interesting stuff there anyway and that's true when you think back to the beginning of the Enron story this stuff about Andy Fastow's <coughs> partnerships was in Enron's financial statement since 1999 or 2000 and nobody nobody looked Looked and nobody cared yeah. until all of a sudden everybody cared. But it, but it was right there for for the looking. In the course of investigating the Enron story, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Commission put something like a million Enron documents on their website, um, and they were documents that didn't have anything to do with the California energy crisis. Just documents they had gotten from Enron, and these documents were completely unorganized. Um, and at the risk of betraying how obsessive I am, my, my co-author and I would sit there at three o'clock in the morning just hunting and pecking on documents and then calling each other up and saying, look what we found. And we found amazing things like emails between Ken Lay and Linda Lay talking about Ken's anti-anxiety medicine. And <laughs> I found this great document um, that was that was Enron internal documents showing that through the year 2001, showing their earnings targets for th for the year and how far behind they were, and that they were short of their earnings targets by something like a billion dollars in the summer of 2001. And it was this was always um, this was a mystery to me um, actually until yesterday, because I couldn't figure out how then they managed to actually produce third quarter earnings that after a whole bunch of supposedly one-time charges were actually what, what Wall Street was expecting. And it turns out, this came out in the trial yesterday, that um, what happened was they had reversed an enormous amount of reserves from the California energy crisis in order to cover this, this huge gap. Um, so, you know, no matter how much work you do, there's always a new piece of information that you can find out. Um, and on that note, I'll pass it on. Thank you, Bethany. <coughs> Jules? I feel like I'm up here with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I heard I heard Newman was recently here with that activist investor Carl Icahn. Uh, really impressive stuff. Uh, really can't add anything more on the subjects that Jim and Bethany have decided to focus on. So, at the risk of not doing the uh, imitation of the hammer. Uh, because that is the the uh, the preconceived idea. Um, uh, because if you're a hammer, everything tends to look like a nail, and we all bring our own biases, based on our own experiences and our outlooks to to situations, and we can often get trapped in it. So what I'd like to do is uh, somewhat reverse the process for a couple of minutes, uh, put put myself in the shoes of your industry, and I'm referring to your industry as the hedge fund industry and the private equity industry and those who are involved in the in the process and and, and touch somewhat on the investigative aspect of things because I think Jim and Bethany have done a, a really first class job in the areas they chose to to focus on but I'd like to give you my perspective because um, I'm also part of the Enron Club so to speak uh, in that uh, 
probably our largest business is running companies that are in bankruptcy, uh, and one of those companies happens to be Enron. And uh, it's it's been fascinating doing the uh, doing the uh, pathology after the after the uh, after the body is left for dead. Um, but having said that, uh, let let me talk for a moment in historical terms, and try to predict what I think is going to happen. Um, today's Wall Street Journal, big article on international management out of Atlanta, a, a good old-fashioned down-home fraud. Um, we're working on that. We're looking for the money. Um, so it's a kind of post facto situation, but the journalists who wrote about that story laid out, laid out some of the most basic uh, things that were not that were not done. And uh, I, I don't want to go over, even though my kids say, Dad, thank you for once again restating the obvious. Uh, it's very, very, very humbling. I, my grandchildren aren't old enough yet to have gotten on to me, but I know it's only a question of time if I, uh, if I live long enough. Um, the, the Bayou case, um, we all refer to these things as aberrations, but they're not aberrations. The phony results that companies put out as to their performances, and every one of you in the room, when I say that, thinks of a thinks of another outfit where you've been skeptical about somebody's what somebody's real performance is. The staggering influence of this industry around the world, the hedge fund industry, the private equity industry, and the fact that hedge funds are becoming private equity outfits, and private equity outfits are becoming hedge funds and the convergence of all that. The implications of this for the people who do it right and try to set standards and try to think ahead and who, who have made their reputations based on that, um, and there are some people here in the room who have made serious e efforts over time to, on a self-governance basis, um, self-governance basis, run this industry in a more effective and honorable way, uh, frankly, people like Jeff Tarrant. Um, they, they are getting uh, put into the same bouillabaisse uh, because of the staggering sums of money that people are making in the private equity game and the hedge fund game. And here's what's going to happen. Number one, you're going to see more bayous and in more international management associates because there is really dumb money going to people who aren't just terribly good investors, but who who uh, will not be able to perform up uh, up to and including a manner that will enable them to hold on to the capital that people give them investment capital give them to work on. Some of those people will will uh, take the honorable path. They'll give the, close the fund and give the money back. Uh, others. Uh, Others are, are not so uh, easily moved in that direction, and they, and they, they will start to uh, either become much more aggressive, um, they will engage in more hostile type activities, they will, they will become uh, more, um, more active and maybe more active in ways that are way, way over the line, or not. Others will, others will feel the pressure to keep that 2% and 20% rolling in, and what they will do is they will cheat. And they will tell their, their clients that their performance is uh, really 14.6%, while the rest of those dumbos are only doing 4.5%, uh, because they've got an unusual strategy. Bullshit. Uh, that's a word of art that we've used for the last 34 years. Uh, <laughs> And uh, at times it served us well, as, lo as long as we don't listen to too much of our own. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but we all become prisoners of what we think and what we're saying and, and, and what other people think we, we are and what our, what our approach is. So I'm very concerned that, to me, it feels a little bit like not early 1987 where there's a lot of money going to people that have no clue on what they're doing, but they've been able to raise the money. Now, think about the implications of that and the behavior. 
Jim talked very clearly about a series of techniques that can be used when you've got the opportunity, when you've got the opportunity for these direct discussions and certain probing and people who are going to go about this in a methodical way. But of course, he's in a position where somebody's come to him because they, they either have a concern or they're sufficiently careful as to how they operate their, their businesses. I don't think that's a huge percentage of the private equity and, and um, the hedge fund population. Uh, so all the techniques Jim uh, talked about are absolutely spot on uh, as part of what one might do if you get to that point. But there is relatively little, uh, relatively little going outside for outside expertise. Uh, for example, the accountants that are typically hired, and we have a large forensic accounting practice. Typically, typically the role in a private equity transaction is to have the accountants do just enough work so that you can make sure you get the kind of terms and conditions and be able to borrow the money at the bank so that you can have put the right amount of leverage in based on what you think it ought to be. It typically speaking is not the hard kicking, the scratching through documents that Bethany talked about, the, the probing, because there isn't enough time. Usually, uh, usually there's competition for these deals if they're any good, and sometimes even if they're crap, there's competition. And as a result, what you get is just enough to either, quote, have something in the file. You've heard that one before. I want something for the file. Or you're under such time pressure that the work that you'll permit your outside professionals to do, whether they're your, your lawyers, or your accountants, or your special consultants, or organizations such as uh, organizations such as the one that Jim represents or I represent. So as a result, what you'll see is more and more performance, I think, that is not accurate. You'll see more and more people under pressure uh, to perform. So how do we look into that, back to the original topic, in such a way that we can rely more heavily <coughs> on, on what we do um, and, and to get higher quality information? Not that this is ever going to be the be-all and end-all. I, I would take at face value what you've just heard from, from Bethany and, and from Jim um, because there's a, a whole series of things one can do, and, and I, I, I hadn't had a chance to read the book uh, be, before, but I certainly will afterward. But the day-to-day -day pressures, when you think about how much you actually looked into the position you talked about taking and, and how long you, you were in the decision-making and research mode in many cases, we, we all operate under time constraints uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, typically you want to go for the information. If you, if you move beyond the interviewing if you move beyond the interviewing um, stage um, and you focus on the paper stage, uh, then you have a chance to um, do both, both your paperwork and you have a chance to do your conversational work when you get the chance, and hopefully you do it well. Now yesterday, we, we recruited a woman named Judy Miller who has won two Pulitzer Prizes for her investigatory work from the Miami Herald. Why are we doing that? We think that we're not doing as good a job in interviewing as we ought to. We think in certain parts of our business, we've gotten stale and we've gotten too many people who look like e each other. Well, think about who works in your organizations. How much diversity of thinking and experience do you really have? Or are you just pulling them out of the cookie cutter from XYZ Investment Bank and XYZ uh, business, uh, business School. So I, I encourage uh, different, different kinds of, of folks in, in the business because they, they will have different life experiences. And so you don't want everybody out there who thinks of themselves as a hammer. You want people who have different mindsets and different experiences. So if you have the luxury, and there are different organizations here and of course not represented in the room, to create that sort of diversity of thinking and experiences, it can be useful if you have the time and if you are willing to make the investment. What I have found 
is that at some point in time, of course, the whole soft dollar, dollar game, I think, will go away uh, because it's, it's semi-corrupted. Um, um, now, not everybody feels that way, but, but I feel that people need to do their own work. You've heard this come out in different ways uh, already uh, this evening. God knows the, the companies in this room uh, are doing well enough for that to take place. But there's an obsessive behavior about not wanting to spend money on the expense, on the expense line and run up the administrative costs or anything else that you can't, people can't lay off on the, on the LPs. And so that's just a reality. And as a result, you have a whole series of outcomes that flow from that. The solution, very simply, is you're, given your own internal resources and those people you can reach outside to employ to, to help you, uh, given the margins of this business at most periods of time, as long as they continue to exist, it's sort of, I think, I would argue that it's, that it's worth it. Uh, just a couple of more things. The aggressiveness that you will see, the increasing aggressiveness, and I love the way, I love the way um, uh, wine uh, keeps getting different labels on it, and, and occasionally even new bottles. Uh, I love the expression activist investor, but we've been here before. Uh, some of these activist investors are doing good things, and they are taking interesting positions, and they are stirring the pot. Um, when a, when a Tweety Brown uh, looks into a Hollinger after many years of being an investor and insists on probing and trying to get un underneath what's going on at Hollinger, and with the benefit of the hindsight, we can, we can applaud that uh, serious work over a long period of time. Probably no one knew how, how weird and strange that place was, was being run. It's usually the case after the fact, by the way. Um, but, but I think what you're going to see is a reaction. We just saw it in the last couple of weeks. You see certain hedge funds and certain short players being sued by companies that they've been looking at. And the people that are, have been engaged to do the research looking at those, those, those subjects are being caught up in the suit because that's what the companies were being looked at thought would be an effective technique. I think what we'll see in the coming months is more of that. Think of it, increased activism to get returns combined with people who feel they're being maligned and badly treated, rightly or wrongly, and the inevitable will happen. And then you'll bring in, you'll bring in uh, uh, lawsuits, uh, you'll try to get your favorite politician to intervene or your favorite regulator and we're off to the races. So my instinct is do your due diligence, but you're doing it in a certain context now. And that context, from my point of view, is welcome back to 1987. Thank you, all three of you, for those insights. Um, I'll kick us off with one question while the audience warms up, and, and I'll look for the next one from you guys. Um, you know, I think all of you have, have um, tied a common uh, thread among you here in, in terms of being professionally skeptical. And uh, one of the things I'm interested in is what, what sets off your skeptical antenna. So what sort of things are the, some of the red flags that you think are, are the kinds of things that you, when you see in a company, you say, aha, there's a company I want to know more about, or there's some more work to do there. You probably all have uh, your own personal favorites. So you're, ta you're talking about companies in general, not necessarily hedge funds? Yeah, companies in general or hedge funds, whichever you have a better story about. Executive departures there you is go. always one. I mean, you and I have you talked start. about that before, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, and you see that, I mean, you saw it with Jeff Skilling. Uh, and you see that all the time. And I, I don't think I've ever seen an executive departure that wasn't pegged to spending more time with his family. It just, <laughs> it, it just, it, it, it just doesn't happen. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I think that, 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 that's one thing. And I think to take it beyond, I mean, in doing due diligence, <clears throat> to go beyond the executive, because he, if a CFO or, or somebody at that level leaves, there, there's going to be a press release. Uh, but Oftentimes, that's followed or preceded by other personnel departures that don't get in the press release. Uh, but there's ways to find that out. I, I think you can poke around a little bit pretty easily and find out a, a lot about that. And that's really where you find out, I think, that, that something's going on, that, uh, w w that the executive departure is not just a, 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 you know, an issue that involves him personally, but there's more behind it. So I, I think that's a key. 
Didn't you try to develop a metric one time about postings on Monster.com or something? <laughs> that... uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's been my theory that you could uh, you could do something like that to, to probably set up some software and, and just have something jump out at you that that a uh, certain number of people have posted and, and are, are looking to leave a, a given company of a certain market market cap and you you have voila an investment opportunity. But uh, short um, anyway, yeah, uh, interesting. It's a red flag. Bethany, Jules, do you have any favorites? I think, as I mentioned earlier, a company that's too promotional, that's too obsessed with its stock price. That was clearly the case at Enron. They had the stock price ticker running on every elevator and a big stock price ticker in the lobby. And Jeff Skilling was one of the few CEOs I've ever come across who had a public price target on, on his own company's shares. But you still see a fair amount of promotional behavior from, from executives. And the more of that there is, the more I think it's a dangerous side. On the flip side, I'd say, as you see now in the case of Overstock.com, um, a company that has, is too too antagonistic toward the short sellers. I I just I don't think that any well-run company really particularly cares about the short sellers and, and their stock. And if they're spending too much time obsessing about them and battling them and denigrating them, there's there's it's it's just a red flag. Well, as a former chairman and CEO of a publicly held company, uh, <laughs> I, I basically can't help myself. Um, uh, I, of course, never paid any attention to the quarterly expectations that analysts had on our stock, um, uh, except uh, uh, early in the morning, the middle of the morning, before I went out to lunch, <laughs> after I came back and at the close of the market, unless I got a call uh, in, in the evening. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really a scary phenomenon that gets set up. And every once in a while, I, I would look in the mirror and say to myself, what the hell are you doing? And what I was saying is, I really would like to have a higher stock price. This is for real. Uh, and anybody who tells you they don't pay attention to that stuff is, has lowered their medication levels. Um, there may be a few. Uh, there may be a few, but uh, it's, it's unusual. So I, I kind of look at uh, people's behavior, not just what they say, but what they do. And I like to see them in environments that are the, the, the less expected environments. So for example, seeing, uh, when, when you see them at one of these conferences and you have the one-on-ones and you have the, the presentations, I, I always found those reasonably uninteresting. But when you see them in informal settings, uh, to me that was where you got better stuff. Um, and uh, I also liked, I liked it when the CEO spoke, they didn't lay it off on a, on a CE, uh, an investor relations person or, or the CFO. I liked to see the color of the man or woman running the company. And when I don't see it, it makes me wonder why. Interesting. Okay. I see a hand back there. Mr. McMiniman. Uh, question for Jules Kroll. Jules, um, hedge funds have argued that investors or LPs performing due diligence is a market-based method of regulation. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Should the SEC intervene? Should uh, regulators come into the space? Or are investors well enough to take care of themselves? I didn't think that issue would ever be raised because I know that the hedge fund industry is not that concerned about regulation. Um, <laughs> I think the regulation is simply inevitable. Uh, you've got you've got a a tidal wave of capital in the control of of these these companies, and I think what will happen is what usually happens: some bad stuff will occur. And enough bad stuff will occur to the wrong person at the wrong time, and some regulator or politician will decide that this is an issue that I'm, I'm going to focus on. And there are ways to, to mitigate that. There are ways to, over time, and there are a number of models to, to, keep, to, to keep more self-regulatory uh, activity going, <coughs> but it's going to be really hard because we're going to see some really bad stuff. Um, and, and you'll see it in other contexts. Regulations get created and, and oversight gets created on the heels of bad things that happen to people, uh, particularly when it affects a lot of people. As opposed, 
Nobody really cares about uh, uh, wealthy Joe Smith who's put $25 million in a particular hedge fund and he loses it, of course, except that person. But when you start having uh, pension funds and public monies and so on and so forth coming into this uh, area, um, I, I think there's going to be there's going to be hell to pay, and the people who will who will end up in the best possible position will be those who have tried to do things the right way all along. But I think regulation is inevitable, and I think this what you've got now is just a gentle tap on the wrist. Spencer, yeah, respond. I've seen a lot of bad things. I was just through an SEC examination, and I can tell you uh, the. The, the conduct and the level of um, knowledge of the regulators was appalling. Um, the uh, I, I'm not sure that um, that sort of um, response is going to be healthy for me. You're just simply adding cost to investors. Maybe the aggregate cost, and maybe the other regulatory teams uh, have a higher level of information and better skill, if you will, in doing what they're doing. But uh, I, I, I was not encouraging what I went through. You know what that's like saying? That's like saying... Uh, that's like saying the person who came to that 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 cop who came to look at the uh, the crime that was occur that occurred in my house didn't really do a good job. But that's not the issue. The issue is what's going on in the house, because inevitably, trust me, somebody better, smarter, more skilled is going to come along. To to me, that and that's why I think the industry has an opportunity to do some things about that. But the industry is not doing that. The industry is now lobbying. The industry is 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 basically lobbying, but it's not changing in terms of its behavior unless it's forced to step by step. So, uh, you know, these uh, fair enough. I mean, look, the, the the number of SEC teams that are actually going out is is a far is a far cry from the number of policemen out roaming about. Number one, mm -hmm. number two, I agree it's inevitable, it's, but it's not because the the hedge fund industry is. Is um, it, it's it's because it's too feeble and too disorganized actually to lobby effectively. I would argue, um, but um, I, I don't I don't think they're looking for the right things, and I don't think I don't think a f five years of training is actually going to make it best. You're going to have a whole raft of new people. The average age will be 26. The level of knowledge will be quite weak, and you'll have this cycle again. I think it's underfunded. The sheer number of investment organizations they have to cover uh, <coughs> is astonishing. And I don't think they're remotely prepared to do it. And that cycle will just cycle over again and again and again. And I'm not sure it's done anything except create a whole industry called chief compliance officers. Um, judging from the headhunters who call me, searching for those people endlessly, that's the business that's been created out of this. And it simply added a layer of substantial cost to hedge fund programs that are very professionally run and considerably done with, with substance and quality and, and pretty uh, pretty significant depth of staffing. So I, I think your comment is fair. It is inevitable, but not for the reasons you're saying. Sounds like we have a good topic for our next session. <laughs> Doug, think, what could the industry do to forestall regulation? This would be a, would be a great next, next one. I'll, I'll sign up for that one. Other comments, questions from the audience? Yeah, right down in the end. Um, a lot of focus is on initial sort of investments and some of the values when they come up front, everybody has their guard up and they're looking at certain things, assuming they're going to um, In some ways, the more difficult problem is the, the Beacon Hill, which may not be familiar, but a well-run hedge fund that had a good reputation, but somewhere in the middle of it gets into trouble and then puts forth um, a, uh, a phony proposition in the middle of a time where nobody would expect it. Um, I'm not even sure who they asked, but any, any sense of how long the defense has been? What do you mean by a phony proposition? Well, they basically forged their books, but not up uh, front, <coughs> but in the middle of what was the well-known business. You have a relationship that already exists. You have to maintain it, but you also have to monitor it. So what you're really asking is, what's the optimal trade-off on ongoing due diligence? You know, once you've made an investment, whether it's in a company or a, or a fund, what's what's the optimal level of ongoing due diligence? That's that's more that's even more important than the initial initial one. What you'll see now is uh, there are people who have had substantial investments in in funds that have gone south. 
And those are the ones that you hear about, uh, as opposed to the ones that are shutting down and opening up under a new name and forgetting past investment histories. Um, but the, the, uh, the level of activity of looking at what's really going on is pretty modest. But I think it's going to increase, and I think it's a, it's a good thing. It should be done by the hedge funds themselves with whatever outside professional support they can garner. I will tell you, in the cases that we've had in the last year, the level of scrutiny by, by well-run funds, fund of funds, has now been ratcheted up for the usual reasons. They had a problem with one of the funds they invested in, and they don't want to have that problem again. So I, I think in many respects it's usually important after you've made the investment to be in there on a regular basis, and people who are w not willing to have that kind of scrutiny, you shouldn't be investing with them. I think also it's fair to say that, uh, that if, even if misconduct came along later in the game, a lack of ethics probably didn't. It was probably already there. And if you do good diligence, due diligence early on, you're probably going to see some of those things, even if it hasn't uh, manifested itself in some obvious public uh, problems. Uh, so I think that there, there probably, with the case you're talking about, there were probably some indications there uh, that uh, where a lack of integrity would have been clear, even if it hadn't uh, caused a problem for the fund early on. Yes, sir. Question for Jules and Jim. Uh, Jules, you alluded earlier to software <coughs> as, as an issue in funds on the come that uh, has been highlighted a little bit, perhaps not so great, that's the way it is. Most of what we've seen in the hedge fund community uh, as it relates to increased due diligence efforts is exactly what you just said, which is something bad happens and the investors don't want the same thing to happen again. Right. I was wondering if you and, and Jim maybe had any thoughts of things you might have seen that we may not have seen yet uh, that could be something that's repeated but hasn't been highlighted because of a fraud or something we might look out for that will be exactly the thing that down the road we'll make sure won't happen again. Yeah. Uh, i got to think. I think he mentioned you first, Jules. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just occurred to me as you were saying that and looking at some of the art around the room that uh, most of you are too young to remember the move, movie Jules et Jim. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you'd be willing to play Jean Moreau, I think we could sell a lot of tickets here. Um, I, uh, I believe in focusing on people who, who have uh, departed places or have a history of, of uh, a negative history with people, the former employees that Jim mentioned before, the people that other folks may have been in litigation with, uh, and, and going, back to, uh, going back to former places of employment to the extent you can get somebody there to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, it's basic stuff, but that probably is your first line of, of opportunity to to understand, and you do need to speak to, uh, you do need to speak to people, even if they have an axe to grind, because they may have an axe to grind, but they may also be right. It's interesting. That's a common theme that all three of you have hit on. That um, even if you find a bias or credibility issue, it doesn't mean you should completely discount the, the evidence that person is offering. It just means you should corroborate or validate it or take it for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Also, that's an interesting insight. If, if I, I think if you're talking about a specific type of misconduct that that will be new uh, to the public, uh, I'm not sure if I can think of anything specific along those lines. Uh, but I think there are, are some other signs that you don't often hear about a, a lot, which I'm sure you guys do look at. And I, one of the things that I see uh, from time to time that I think is, is kind of glaring, but I suppose it requires a certain level of access to, to a hedge fund, is, is the level of objectivity uh, w within the fund among the personnel. I think that probably some of the most uh, uh, well-run, well-managed uh, hedge funds are ones where where you know the leadership really encourages some sort of internal dissent 
uh, on you know any investment thesis or issue, G you know genuine uh, differences of opinion where where you'll have you know different people ha with, with different opinions, and then you say, hey, you know we, we got to track this down and figure it out, whether we we do it internally or whether we go outside to do that, uh, that we're going to do that, uh, and sometimes I think that 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 comes through when you see uh, portfolio managers who really are only it becomes pretty evident that they're only interested in hearing information that supports their their thesis and if it doesn't they really don't want to hear it and, and when that happens it's pretty obvious and usually when you see it with somebody you see it repeatedly so i think that's just a, one of those things that may be kind of below the radar screen but you know there's some problems like that out there so you'd pull your money if one of your, <laughs> one of your clients is re re routinely rejecting things that aren't what they want to hear uh yeah okay. yeah but a lot of times that's that's it, it's it's portfolio it's it's not just you know necessarily the management of, of the fund, but it may be individual portfolio managers. Don, you don't you don't need to interview the badge from manager himself to or, or herself to to get color on the place. You can see a lot of other tones when you walk into the place, and uh, the receptionist looks like the, you know, the bombs have been recently going off, and he just turns <laughs> over the junior analysts. You know you can you can pick up a lot just by just walking around the place. So it's really just about being diligent and making sure. You don't substitute either letters or phone calls for actual visits. Where are people calling from? I mean, I hear this stuff all the time. You know, it stops being from from the office, and it's uh, it's out in the Hamptons somewhere. You know, just you just pay attention to small details. But, uh, um, you don't need to be a genius about it. You just need to do your homework. Is that a good sign or a bad sign when they're calling from the office? <laughs> it, it's, it's bad unless it's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you have a question in the front row? Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. My name is Jumbo Tanaka. Uh, between 1998 and 2003, I was uh, head of uh, Japan operation for New York-based uh, uh, distress fund, investing about seven million dollars in Japan. And I retained various different uh, investigation firms. And I was a client of uh, Grow also. When I received your report, uh, I was quite impressed about uh, the individuals and companies in Japan, very, very local. Uh, the report all written in English. I have a question for Jim and Joris. Um, for CIA or Crow to find a key person works for you in place like Japan with different language and different culture, what is the rule of the thumb to find the best person to gather those intelligence? Hmm. Uh, on what type of issue? Uh, on you know, mainly for me, um, it was, uh, counterparty issue, make sure they are not bad people. Um, but for CIA to have a key Japan you know, person, uh, Japanese or American, works for CIA or to do the business in Japan, you know, how do you find uh, those people? Well, I'll start with that one, and I'll tell you that I think about that question a little bit differently than I think what you're describing, and that is uh, I've always kind of felt that that you really don't want to rely on necessarily, necessarily an existing network of contacts, that, that every new issue requires new sources. And I think that uh, really, you know, if, if you're... I, th I think it's important to, to to view it that way to say okay if I'm doing something in Japan for example I, somebody came to me and they had a problem in Japan I probably w what are the chances that the people that I already know in Japan are going to be able to tell me exactly what I need to know about a specific issue and I hear people talk about that all the time and I really don't believe it because the, really it doesn't work that way so I think it's important really is is to be skilled in identifying you know to to say okay what is my issue really get to know it well and 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 then you know look at it a little more f further and figure out, okay, I, 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 need, I need somebody else here. Um, so, so I, I mean, I guess, I, I don't know if I'm saying this very clearly, but, but I, I really wouldn't rely on, on a given person for every problem in Japan or, or anywhere else. I, I think it's important to be specific to the problem. Well, CIA can afford many different people, but... <laughs> <laughs> we, we work on a much more limited budget. Um, but... Uh, I would say that uh, in Japan we've had three, uh, let me tell you the things we've done right and the things we've done wrong. The things we've done wrong is a much longer list because we've now had an office in Japan for 14 years and uh, even today it's not a very big operation uh, and everybody in the office is Japanese. 
everybody is a Japanese national, except for this strange Irish national who's an expat over there, who, who when you hear him speak Japanese, it's really a wild uh, experience. Uh, we made a series of mistakes, and the mistakes we made were re relying on subcontractors. And uh, they were n of, of various kinds. Some were academics, some were researchers, some were journalists. Some They came from different fields. But the mistake we made was they didn't feel truly part of our organization. Because in the beginning, we couldn't afford it. We didn't think we could afford it. We learned later that uh, the loyalty factor and the sense of pride of being part of an organization in Japan is all important for us. And so we've, we had to ratchet back. We had to go more slowly. And then uh, we had more luck um, at both ends of the, uh, the age spectrum. We began to recruit directly from uh, universities for people who would think about working for an American firm, which is not exactly a natural act especially when the major occupation of investigators in Japan was trying to determine whether the spouse that somebody was about to marry had any Korean blood in them. That's what most investigators in Japan spend their time on. Every country's got a different issue. So we hired at two ends, the very young who could begin a career with us and would think that it would be something special and hopefully it would become that. Uh, but we couldn't get the cream of the crop because we didn't have prestige, and in Japan, prestige is a big deal. The other place where we had luck was we had luck uh, with older people over the age of 55 who, in Japan, many people have second careers. But we ended up hiring only from places where they had pre previous experience with an American institution, a corporation, or, the, or some part of the American government because they were used to dealing with Americans. Uh, Japan has been very hard for us. We haven't built a big business, but I would suggest that you think about uh, uh, hiring at those ends of the spectrum because in between they will be nervous about <coughs> joining you, I think. Thank you. Yes, sir. Since it's kind of a late hour, thing, <coughs> each of the three of you can tell us a, a humorous example of something you were covered in the course of one year. <laughs> Humorous. But not off color, right? So. <laughs> or, well, you know, it's pretty late hours. <laughs> Sounds like your area. <laughs> the only problem, the, the first one that comes to mind is somewhat off color, but it's not that terrible. So I think you can my, get away with it. <laughs> um, my, my favorite, my favorite Enron story, and it's it's a guy that a lot of people say sort of tongue in cheek that they admire most. But it's this guy named Lou Pai, who was a Enron executive who helped start their trading operation, and later was the head of this business called EES or Enron Energy Services that was Enron's disastrous foray into retail energy. And uh, Lou Pai was known for two things: he was a really brutal political infighter, and he was he was obsessed with strippers, and he managed to leave Enron with more money than anybody, over 250 million dollars. And the reason he sold stock before the bankruptcy. He, his ostensible excuse was that he, he divorced his wife in order to marry a stripper with whom he had had a child. And so he got out right in front, right in front of the collapse. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> There's a humorous story. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, yeah, sure. I will. <laughs> well, Go for it. No, I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> well, actually I, I, actually, I do have a question for Bethany. What, what's the prediction on the outcome of the trial? I, you know, I would, I would never make a prediction. I've always thought that en Enron is a case of very clear ethical wrongdoing at the top, but not such clear criminal wrongdoing, and the prosecutors have a really tough case in, in front of them. Um, they've done a, the prosecution has done a great job thus far. They, they really have. They've, the, the jury is going to be judging this case as it actually happened, but the defense will argue at every point that the accountants and the lawyers signed off on many of the shenanigans that Enron did, and the truth is they did sign off on it, so it may turn out that you can buy accountants and lawyers and you can also spend $100 million on a defense team and you can walk away from a gigantic fraud. And it may, that may well be the answer. You think there's a significant difference between Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling in terms of 
I do, I do. I think Jeff Skilling was much more central to what happened there, but I think a lot of the testimony at the trial, the surprising thing has been how much Ken Lay knew when he stepped back in as CEO, how much he knew of Enron's problems. And, you know, he tried to hide those problems in the name of trying to save his company. I mean, he was, he was, he was doing the wrong thing while working toward the right outcome. And the question is, when does that go across the line and when is that criminal, even though his motivation was, in a sense, the right one? Notice how I got out of, out of answering the uh, humor <laughs> story <turn>. question. It was <laughs> we might have time for one more. Yes. Oh, come on. Question for Bethany. You mentioned, okay. I appreciate the tenacity of calling as many people as you can and so forth. But inevitably, you're going to be calling people who are not principals who are you're just trying to get information and they may not be involved at all. And they, they may be self deluded, also the victims. And how do you safeguard against creating Bethany fatigue amongst these people? And, you know, <laughs> even if they're not such a thing. Even if they're not principals and not guilty, you, know, you could create a backlash of people who it gets around the office and they try to shut you up and shut you down or this very you internally and you kind of cuts off the flow of information. I don't. I think you can tell by people's reaction to you whether they want to talk to you or whether they don't want to talk to you, and. I, I just I'm I'm careful with any sources I develop to try not to to try not to take take advantage of them or to try not to make them sick of me, especially the the more the more helpful they are. And you can tell when someone's tolerance for you is is, is waning thin, and you just take a break for a little while. Um, I've also always believed, whenever possible, in meeting people in person because people have a much longer tolerance usually for a personal conversation than they do for a conversation over the phone. So, but it's just on an individual, just a case by case basis. Maybe we can do one more. I, th I think I saw a couple of hands back there. Yes, please. Hi. Um, just reaction to the SEC's um, issuing subpoenas to reporters and then pulling them back, and then definitely your reaction to that in terms of has the pendulum swung you know, with corporations maybe trying to put the stop to good investigations by hedge funds? What do you think? Reaction to that? And as, as as part of the press, I think it's I think it's terrible. I think it sets a terrible precedent. I think that a lot of there are a lot of investors who don't want to hear anything bad about a company that they've they've invested in and blame the press for delivering the bad news. But the truth is, press contacts with short sellers are one of the few ways that skeptical information about a company will make its way into the marketplace. I mean, those of us in the press, even if we understand finance, are still only as good as as good as our sources. And most people simply don't want to talk to the press on the record. And if you shut down that flow of information and that flow of a different point of view I just you end up with you end up with reporters who can speak to company management about what's 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 going on at the company and then you get you, you get a very you get a very one-sided story I just I, I think I'm horrified so there's nothing the press is interested in more than the other press uh, so I thought maybe they they were hoping for short-term relief but in, in an effort in that case, in an effort to uh, achieve uh, relief from athlete's foot, uh, they're going to get an amputation. Um, the reason you see uh, people emboldened to take this kind of operation uh, on, underway, and, and over the years when we, when we are sane and we are careful about what we're doing, we generally avoid investigating certain categories of people. Not always. The press, judges, prosecutors and regulators. It doesn't mean it's always the case, but, but generally speaking, you, you avoid it like the plague because uh, the repercussions of doing it are, are so serious. I thought, I thought the serving of subpoenas was either amateur hour or somebody was able to reach in politically. I think in this case it was, who was the, uh, was it Overstock? Okay, well, you know. You have a certain amount of, of uh, attitude, a certain amount of money, and a certain amount of political connections. You can get somebody to do something. We will see more of this. We will see more efforts with people who don't want their, their beehive poked. And there will be a counter-reaction. Uh, there always is. And you don't know where it's going to happen and what particular case and who they're going to go to, but it's, it's inevitable. I thought I thought those subpoenas were beyond Bush League and were stupid. Uh, other than that, I don't have any strong feelings about it. <laughs>
on that timid note, I think we'll, we'll call it a wrap. Doug, you probably want to say a word or two to wrap us up, but before we do, um, a, a very big thank you to the Greenwich Roundtable for sponsoring this event tonight. It's uh, an organization I've gotten to know pretty well in the last few months, uh, largely through their search process, and I just have been incredibly Im impressed by uh, Lloyd and the search process that he ran and the, the trustees and the members of the search committee that that I've been involved with. It's a, it's a really world-class organization, and I think uh, events like tonight show what a world-class organization it is. I think maybe the best testament to the process you ran, Lloyd, was that you, you wound up with Doug, um, and with a, an extraordinarily capable new leader for the organization, teamed up with Steve McMiniman, who I think has exactly complementary skills. I have a lot of high hopes for the Greenwich Roundtable, and thank you very much for having us all here tonight. Well, Don, thank you for being here. Thank you, Don, and thank you for doing a wonderful job as our moderator this evening. Just a wonderful job and wonderful introductions to all of our speakers, um, and extremely well done. And it's a privilege and a pleasure to have you here. I do want to uh, thank Spencer and the Education Committee for being our host this evening. Um, it's a very important part of what we do, and we appreciate your hosting us, and we appreciate the good work that the Education Committee is doing. Um, for those of you who didn't receive it in the mail or haven't opened your mail or didn't see them on the way in, um, uh, there are copies of uh, the most recent due diligence piece that the Education Committee has put out uh, on global macro and managed futures. So please, if you don't have it, uh, please pick one up on the way out, though I do see some on chairs, uh, things of that nature. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, our next symposium is next Thursday morning, the 16th, 8 a.m. here at the Bruce Museum. Uh, the topic will be the demographics of opportunity. And finally, uh, many of you have been receiving emails from me. Uh, wanting to get together and meet each of you individually, uh, which I very much look forward to do. For those who have come back and with whom I have appointments, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, to those I haven't uh, caught up with yet, please uh, respond when you get an email from Doug Moffitt, and I look forward to meeting you as well. Uh, thanks, most importantly, to our three wonderful speakers this evening, Jim, Bethany, and Jules. What an outstanding panel we've had and a great discussion. We are privileged to have had you and grateful for the time you spent with us. And thanks so much for your wisdom and your insights. Thank you. Thank you.